Okay, see, I didn't want recording. How do I stop the recording? Okay. Let's make sure we've got everything looking right. Everyone can see the big screen? Yep. Excellent. Well, look, um, not everybody's here yet. However, I will get rolling on it. We are recording this and I will be um, sending them out in the next day or so um, as a link, firstly to those that have registered and secondly, then it'll sit on the local buy website. So um, today's webinar is around new energy vehicles and mobility. And uh, we've got four, four companies presenting today. We've got SG Fleet, we have Jolt Charge, um, we have Movement, and we have Goodyear Tire. So everyone's got a slightly different perspective on the world. I'm just going to make sure that I'm clicking through the screens here correctly. So first up, I just we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognise their continuing connection to the land, water and community. We pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and we're on the terrible lands here in uh, Brisbane today. So as I just said, we've got Goodyear Tyres, um, Stephen Tobin and Adrian will be speaking, um, Joel Charge, Andrew Hall, Movement will be Nathan Gore-Brown and Mark possibly and SG Fleet, we've got Wayne Excel and Lincoln. Um, and we're going to actually open up with, with Wayne and Lincoln. So um, I'll just uh, let you start, Wayne. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Shane, and uh, really appreciate the opportunity to, um, uh, to present today uh, around future mobility uh, here in Australia um, and also uh, New Zealand. Um, just a bit of background, first of all, uh, I myself, I'm the general manager of sales with an SG fleet. We have Lincoln DeKelb, I should say, who's our manager for product development and innovation within SG fleet. Uh, we as an organisation are, are actively involved at, at, uh, at all levels of government, whether it be federal, state or local government. We actively play a role in that space uh, in, in providing various mobility solutions to that. And uh, Shane requested that we provide a, a brief update as to uh, the, the current state of play uh, when it comes to EVs. Um, just some uh, learnings that we've had around our, what, we, what we've identified through the transitioning of our customers to uh, more sustainable mobility solutions and what the future landscape looks like moving forward. Now, we've only got 15 minutes. We've got a very um, brief amount of time here, 15, 20 minutes. So there's, there's clearly a lot of information that we could cover off. I think, Lincoln, you could probably talk for days around this as well. Um, so what I have done at the end of this um, slide deck is provide a, a contact, um, uh, which is Mike Cleveland. Um, Mike is on the call, but he's, he's not a presenter at the moment. But um, Mike Cleveland is our BDM uh, in Queensland, looking after Queensland and Northern Territory. And obviously, we've got BDMs across all regions nationwide as well. So I might get you to move to the next slide, if that's okay, Shane. Lincoln, I might just pass this over to you from this point um, in regards to the current state of play. No problem, thank you, Wayne. So as Wayne said, um, my, my role is product development and innovation. My focus is very much on uh, future mobility. Zero emission fuels, which includes uh, EVs and hydrogen is obviously a very key remit, but so is autonomous vehicles, connected cars, Micro mobility, mobility as a service. So there's a lot of content that I can cover off at, at different times. So we might just jump into the next slide and just at a very high level, we'll go through um, the, the, we, the, the acronyms and definitions when we're talking about zero emission vehicles. So the first is ICE, which is internal combustion engines. This is your traditional fuels like petrol and diesel. Then you've got battery electric or BEV, and that's where it's running purely on the battery uh, and not using uh, traditional fuels. Uh, as opposed to your hybrid vehicles where you, you, you run on petrol and then it generates its own electricity. 
And then you've got the plug-in hybrids where you physically plug it in and it's running dual motors of both uh, traditional fuels and electric that you do plug it in so you get a, a higher range. So that just sort of sets the baseline of the, the, the different types of hybrid vehicles. Um, and I've got a slide a little bit later on about how you can mix and match these uh, based on your decarbonisation strategies. Again, on the next slide, if I can, Shane. Um, again, I won't go into a lot of detail with this, but just be aware that when you are looking at different types of electric vehicles, they do come with different plug types. Uh, and the plug types would define what type of charging stations you would need to, to have, or the types of cables that you need <coughs> to connect from the charging station into the car. Um, the Australian market is tending to, to um, centralise on the Type 2 on the AC side and the CCS combo on the, on the right-hand side, right side for DCs. So just, uh, I don't I want to go into the details of it, but just be aware of it. Um, and then some people do talk to me about uh, vehicle to grid uh, and vehicle to grid at the moment only uses that Chatamo type four plug there on the bottom right hand side. So again, just be aware that if you're looking at this sort of future state technologies, uh, they, each of the plug types have a different type of uh, technology capability. Right, and we we'll jump on to the next slide. Um, so this is just to give you a visual indication that the, the average range for battery electric vehicles is increasing year on year. So whereas range anxiety uh, is a thing uh, for a lot of people, it's becoming less of a thing um, because both the batteries uh, are increasing, which means the range is increasing, uh, but also because the uh, high proliferation of charging stations, which Andrew will talk about, no doubt, from the jolt side. And I've got a little bit of a slide on that later on as well. Jump into the next slide. This gives you a bit of an indication of what the OEMs are doing when it comes to uh, their decarbonisation or their move to electric vehicles. And you can see by 2030, there's a huge shift within the OEM market. Now I'm predicting, other people in the organisation uh, disagree with me, that by 2028, it's actually going to start getting difficult to buy petrol vehicles in Australia. Uh, you're going to get more and more electric vehicles across all the different ranges. By 2035, you probably won't be able to get petrol vehicles. And a lot could happen between now and then, obviously. Um, so just think about that from a leasing point of view, that's only two lease cycles away. So you need to start planning now about your transition to electric vehicles because it is a bit of a journey. <clears throat> we jump into the next slide. Uh, I definitely won't go into this line by line. Obviously we'll share this with you afterwards. It gives you an indication of what uh, makes and models are available now and their indicative prices, uh, their RRP. So there is quite a few out there, uh, different makes, models, ranges, different plug types. So a lot of things there to think through. I think the key thing there too, Lincoln, if I may just add, is that um, obviously we're happy to provide some um, what we call total cost of ownership analysis. And there's also some additional um, benefits at a, a government rebate perspective that uh, obviously is um, due to come through on legislation, hopefully soon around FBT. Um, so watch this space, the uh, the total cost of ownership will looks like it will come down significantly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I saw a report just this morning um, over a 15 year lifespan, which is not your traditional lease. Uh, the total cost of ownership is is far, well, it's becoming cheaper um, for battery electrics than it is ICE vehicles. And that will continue to go down as battery prices come down and technology hits scale. Jumping to the next slide, it gives you an indication of the vehicles. Oh, now we've dropped the slide. There we go. Um, the future model releases. So again, there's quite a, a number of vehicles. This is not comprehensive. Uh, the biggest gap that we have in the market that most people will be aware of is the ute form factor uh, and like commercial, but the like commercial is starting to be um, uh, fixed, but the ute model is still uh, a gap. But there's a good pipeline of vehicles. And I think with the recent government elections, labor coming through, we'll see an increase in the makes and models coming into the Australian market as a result. What I want to do next is just take you through some transition insights. In particular, um, if we just yeah, jump through, okay, the slide's a bit, bit messed up, but that's okay. Um, when you're thinking about decar, we, we generally start the conversation with the fleet manager and they'll come to us and say, well, we want to move to electric vehicles. And if you scratch the surface a little bit and say, well, why do you need to, why do you want to transition? Generally, it's part of this whole decarbonization strategy. Are there 2025 targets, 2030, 2035 targets? And what um, our advice is, there are multiple ways to hit your decarbonisation targets, particularly over a, a period of time. So you can apply a very simple risk management framework. You can avoid, reduce, accept or transfer. And within each of those categories, there's different things you can do as an organisation to reduce your carbon across the, across the organisation. So that's th the main point of that slide. It doesn't have to be a wholehearted transition to electric vehicles. It can be a transition through hybrid technologies, plug-in hybrids, if that's the way you want to go, uh, carbon offsetting schemes, or even uh, driver education as well can help reduce your carbon. 
Next slide shows a, uh, a case study. Uh, SG Fleet's head office is in Pimble in Northern Sydney. And we went down this journey about three years ago and it was a challenging installation, A, because it was very new to market, but also because it was an older building, the electrical infrastructure was out of date. We needed switchboards upgraded. We need to identify the parking spots. We had to negotiate with other tenants. From where to go, it actually took nine months. Uh, and that was with somebody, uh, with a team of people working on it that knew reasonably what to do, but it was still a bit of a challenge. You contrast that to the next slide, which is our ACT office in Fishwick. Um, the, it's an old uh, industrial site, lots of three phase power. We thought this would be easy to do. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the, the building manager was on board. They really wanted to put charging stations. It still took six months. So the point being, if you, again, if you wanna start, start the transition, if you want electric vehicles in your fleet within the next 12 months, you need to start looking at your site capabilities now uh, and engaging electrical infrastructures to look at how much electricity is available, how many charging stations, what is your charging station strategy generally across your fleet. They're all uh, important questions that you need to solve for. Um, and then we jump onto the next slide there. Um, so a bit of a plug for SG Fleet. We are a member of the Electric Vehicle Council and the Australian Hydrogen Council. Um, I sit on working groups across those and we do have one of our senior executives on the board of directors for electric vehicles. We've been running this e-start program now for about three years, almost four, and this is supporting fleet managers in transitioning to electric vehicles. And then finally, we're right at the front with the ongoing innovation with Vehicle to Grid, uh, with the REVS project, which is uh, out of the ACT. Uh, and also we were uh, lucky enough to register the first 21 hydrogen passenger vehicles in Australia uh, as part of the ACT trial. Uh, so getting some great learnings out of that. Hydrogen is a really interesting um, step, which I can talk through for probably two and a half days underwater. Um, but there's a lot of movement happening there, particularly in the, uh, the light industry and heavy commercial. And finally, the last couple of slides I've got is around the future mobility. Um, and this is uh, just a, a bit of an idea of what the public charging or the ch charge point operator network looks like. And at the moment, it's very, very fragmented. Um, and some people say, is this a bad thing? My personal view is no, it's not, because the, the nature of charging, uh, the bottom dot point there, it's a shift of mindset. You want to, with, with uh, traditional fuels, you stop to refuel, but with electric vehicles, you want to refuel when you stop. So having these different types of commercial models uh, and business models, uh, I think is a good thing. So you've got EV networks uh, that really focus on the DC fast corridors, ChargeFox, arguably one of the largest in Australia, Jolt, who Andrew, Andrew can talk through later on, and then quite a number. And then of course, traditional fuel providers like Ampol and BP have also announced major plans to roll out charging stations onto their four courts. Again, I think it's, uh, there, there will be a fit for purpose uh, solution for you. Um, and then SG Fleet, we need to look at how do we become an orchestration layer because our customers shouldn't have to carry around eight different cards for different charging stations and how do we facilitate the best possible customer outcome. The last slide that I've got here is just a little bit on future fuels, particularly on hydrogen. Like I said before, we've, we've partnered with ACT government with a hydrogen trial. Um, my personal, well, this is a little bit out of date now, but the hydrogen state of play, this hydrogen market, it's very much focused on energy export and the fertilizer market and, and explosives, strangely enough, of creating the hydrogen. So transportation is actually a distant fourth, uh, but that is being sold for. So there's been quite a number of announcements in the last couple of months about the, uh, the hydrogen corridor up the Eastern seaboard starting down in Geelong. We've also got two hydrogen refueling stations open up now in our, our Tona in Victoria and also the ACT. Uh, and they're really trying to aim for that $2 per kilogram point um, to make it cost effective. A lot of the studies I'm seeing at the moment is the, the initial foray into hydrogen would be about $2.40, $2.60 per, per kilogram. Um, but very much watch this space and the hydrogen industry around heavy commercial in particular will be a hub and spoke type model where um, hydrogen hubs pop up and, and the transportation sector moves in. I think that's uh, all I've got. It was 17 slides and then my remit was 15 minutes. So hopefully I did that fairly quickly. Um, and like, I, like Wayne, and Wayne said, we can uh, talk about this uh, offline uh, in, in any detail you want to get into. Yeah, that's great, Lincoln. And as we've got there uh, uh, is uh, Mike's details. So Mike's uh, based in our Queensland office. We have BDMs across all regions uh, in each state. Uh, but Mike would be more than happy to assist with any, any further inquiries or information that you may have um, Shane, if there's any questions, happy to open it up. Yeah, we're going to leave the Q&A to um, the end. Yep. So um, people can pop their questions through the Q&A 
um, tab in here and I'll have a, I'll open that up at the end of the, the presentation. So thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Adrian. And I will move on to um, young uh, Andrew Hall from Jolt. Yeah, mate, I'm looking pretty young there. Look, thanks so much for the opportunity to, to talk all things EV charging and appreciate the subtle, gentle plug, pardon the pun, uh, Lincoln as well. But um, look, I'm, I'm Andrew Hall, City Relations Manager of Jolt, uh, really focusing on building uh, partnerships and relationships with all levels of, of government, uh, but also private landowners uh, and fleet operators, of course. Um, a quick word on Jolt. Um, we are an owner operator of fast public uh, EV charging infrastructure, uh, really looking to address some of the key barriers to EV uptake. Uh, and the way that we do that is uh, by partnering up with, uh, with those uh, site hosts uh, to roll out a network of these charges. Um, and just one point before we jump on to the next slide, but we'd love for you guys to take away three, three key points about our model. So the first is that we do this at zero cost with our partners. Uh, Jolt covers all the costs um, relating to CapEx, OPEX. Uh, we provide uh, an element of uh, free community charging as well. So seven kilowatt hours worth of free energy every day, uh, really looking at, at addressing some of those key barriers. And third, we, we also deploy an advertiser funded model. So because we, we rely on two revenue streams, we can really safeguard the long-term viability uh, of the network and also make sure the technology is upgraded in line with market expectations. Uh, you can go to the next slide if you like, Shane. Um, so like I mentioned, oh dear, uh, yeah, the formatting didn't quite translate very well, but um, as I mentioned, a couple of barriers to EV uptake, um, of course, a lack of these public charges, affordability, um, also range anxiety typically uh, mean that there is a bit of a handbrake as to people uh, taking up EV. Of course, Lincoln alluded to a few supply issues as well, um, uh, which would really unlock uh, EV uptake across Australia. Um, but a few challenges I've noticed that face council, but also this uh, relates to a lot of other uh, private landowners, uh, is that they, they are looking at pushing green initiatives, looking at reducing their, their carbon in, uh, footprint. Uh, transport typically makes up about 30% of total emissions across uh, LGA, sometimes a bit higher. Uh, they are looking at uh, encouraging EV uptake. So of course, transitioning fleet, um, uh, putting charges in the back of council owned buildings, um, having awareness education programs, they are looking to push EV. Probably the biggest limiter for councils and also other um, private landowners uh, is limited resources uh, for these uh, charges. So uh, being able to carve out a budget for what is a, a really capital intensive project can be tricky, but also just having the time expertise um, is also quite difficult. Uh, also community feedback, people are starting to reach out in droves to council saying, hey, look, I've got a charger. Uh, sorry, I, I, I'm wanting to buy an EV. What's council uh, doing to help me, even though I can't say, for example, charge at home for whatever reason that might be. Go to the next slide. Yeah, just a few points on uh, DC versus AC. I thought it might be useful given the audience today. But uh, from a really uh, broad perspective, there are three types of charges. Uh, you've got the slow charges, the AC charges, which are great for when you can lock up a spot for a long period of time. So say, for example, you're charging cars overnight in your own garage, or if you've got a depot, um, having, having no time constraints as to how long that car needs to be there. And then there not being an imperative for high turnover or frequency, use, uh, frequency of use of that parking bay, uh, slow charging makes a lot of sense from uh, the perspective of the health of the battery um, to just getting that charge over a long period. Um, so slow charging definitely has its time and place. On the other side of the spectrum, you've got the ultra rapid fast charging, the big, you know, 350 kilowatt uh, kahunas um, on the sides of highways. Um, these are great for long distance um, regional driving where you just want to go in, get your charge, uh, car charged up in a really short time. Um, of course, you have to be mindful that the, uh, the, significant, the, the outlay for these are, are enormous, astronomical. Um, and then where we're sort of operating is somewhere in between. We're looking at uh, DC fast charging, 25 to 50 kilowatt. And uh, we think it's most appropriate for the public realm. So where the imperative is that you really are looking to um, incentivize people to uh, go through that parking bay quite quickly. 
um, and just really targeting more of the top up functionality. Um, but because we also do have um, uh, the, the paid uh, charge after the seven kilowatt hours, it also opens up a whole lot of other use cases. So we think DC charging makes a lot more sense in the public realm. Um, there's also an interesting dynamic between AC and DC charge, whereby um, each individual EV model will be regulated by, uh, will regulate the amount of speed uh, of which the energy comes through into the battery. And it depends on um, the, the onboard inverter, what the uh, upper limit of that is. So for example, uh, on AC charging, an and Leaf might charge a lot slower than say, for example, a Tesla. Um, whereas with DC charging, sort of bypasses that onboard inverter and, um, and virtually all the EV models should get roughly about the same speed, especially when you're looking up to about 50 kilowatt um, per hour. Anything more than say 125 kilowatt um, is sort of overkill. Um, a lot of cars don't, actually most cars don't have that capability just yet. Uh, next slide. Uh, so yeah, a little bit about us, like I mentioned, we do provide seven kilowatt hours worth of free energy every day. Uh, gives people about uh, 45 to 50 kilometers worth of driving, which really satisfies people's everyday driving behaviors, particularly in urban metro settings. Uh, so we're not looking at deploying those huge, big 350 kilowatt charges. We're really looking at addressive, addressing the everyday driving behaviors of people. Um, with a 25 kilowatt uh, DC charger, it takes about say 15, 20 minutes to get that seven kilowatt hours. Um, we do have both the CCS and Chidemo plug types, as Lincoln um, uh, referred to before. Chidemo is really just focusing on some of the Japanese models. And um, I think eventually, not just yet, but eventually they will be phased out um, because CCS is just um, starting to become uh, the standard. Um, but of course, when EVs came out, out onto the uh, out onto the market in in a big way, it was a much more um, uh, unstandardized or destandardized, uh, decentralized way of doing it. So CCS really does um, uh, look after the bulk of EV models. Um, and also, like I mentioned, if people do charge uh, on our charges each day, they're saving uh, over a thousand dollars. Next slide. Um, a little plug for us, um, a great little flex. We're actually the largest fast charge network in Sydney and Adelaide metro areas by unique locations. Uh, we've actually got 16 charges up and running across six LGAs in Sydney, and that's with our partnership with Ausgrid. Um, as Lincoln um, mentioned before, we do uh, repurpose existing street uh, infrastructure and, and really upgrade it for that additional purpose of EV charging, fast EV charging. Um, uh, it's, it's great to say that we are the biggest. We've only got 16. It's probably a poor reflection of what's happening in Sydney um, and how far behind uh, we are when it really, really should be a, a lot more to be number one. Um, we've also announced a partnership with Endeavour Energy. So looking at installing up to a thousand charges over uh, Western Sydney. So really similar to what we're doing with Osgrid. And we've actually gone global. So we've got offices in New Zealand, US, Canada and UK. And we should have um, our first charges going into the ground um, actually this quarter. Um, a few of the examples of, uh, of the councils that we're partnered up with, um, but of course, uh, quite a few other uh, private landowners that I haven't included here. Um, just one, one extra point on this, uh, there will be a significant need for these fast charges. So uh, we're anticipating about two to three million EVs on the road uh, in the next uh, seven and a bit years. So it will be an incredibly steep curve, especially if some of those policy settings really take hold uh, that Lincoln mentioned. Um, uh, to accommodate the number of EVs, we need to have a huge number of these fast public charges. So looking at around about 20 to 30,000 fast charges. Um, so at the moment, there's probably about three or 400 littered around um, Australia. Uh, and uh, as Lincoln mentioned, these things take time. It does take time to actually install these uh, charges. Uh, so really getting ahead of the curve and front running this process as much as possible is, uh, will be half the trick. Uh, next slide. Um, so just a few of the product offerings that we have. So of course we've got the Osgrid and Endeavor um, infrastructure. So uh, our enclosure sits on top of these big distribution kiosks. Um, but we also have standalone infrastructure, which gives us a little bit more flexibility with, with where we put these charges. 
Uh, we're also looking at last mile mobility. So looking at e-scooters and e-bikes to really flesh out the, the broader transport spectrum. And just given the fact that each point along that transport spectrum is being electrified and we're looking at uh, providing fit for purpose solutions um, to address uh, those uh, advancements. Uh, next slide. Uh, also backed by BlackRock. So, um, you know, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, uh, institutional investor in the world with um, uh, almost 10 trillion under uh, management. Um, a real vote of confidence to have them on board and, uh, and clearly a sign of the maturity of the EV charging uh, network in Australia and the direction that it's, uh, that, that it's going in, but um, uh, really good to have them on board. Uh, next slide. I thought I would just share a really quick case study um, and I'll try to be as brief as possible, but uh, we do have a few charges up and running in uh, one of the LGAs in the Northern Beaches, um, an LGA in Sydney. And we've got five charges up and running there. That was the first um, LGA that we launched in Sydney and uh, great utilization levels. So between two charges that we have in um, a suburb called Mona Vale, um, they're being utilized uh, for five hours on average each day, which is, which is huge. Um, in the public realm. Um, great community support. So people actively want these. Um, we went through an extensive notification process both before and after the charges went in and uh, huge response, something like 600 responses and uh, really positive, 84%. Really interesting stat in the middle right-hand corner, 55% of people do things while they charge. It's sort of intuitive, um, but we went through a whole lot of surveying and, and interviewing to find out that people reclaim their time while they're waiting for their charge. So they're not just sitting idly by, they're going for walks, they're going shopping, they're buying coffees, uh, they're interacting and engaging with uh, local businesses. So there is an interesting positive economic benefit to having these charges out in the wild. Um, a lot of these sessions are free. So um, really validating a lot of the assumptions we had around our model and how people would interact with our charges um, in, uh, in more urban settings. And uh, the last stat uh, just shows that people are enjoying our charges as well. Uh, next slide. Look, so final slide, um, just summarizing what it is we bring to the table. Uh, we're zero cost. Uh, we, we do um, provide some really interesting benefits. Um, one thing that I did want to mention and um, would be interested to hear what Lincoln and, uh, and Wayne have to say, but uh, from some of the discussions that I've been having with, uh, with councils, for example, um, they are targeting uh, more and more of an, a transition towards EV. And with that comes the discussion of how many EVs is enough, how many are sufficient, uh, how many EV charges rather for, per EVs. And at the moment, they're looking at around four to one. So for every four EVs that you have in your fleet, you'll need at least a, a charger. And that's just to kick things off. Eventually, it'll get to the point where you'll probably have uh, the ratio being closer to two to one. So for every two EVs that you have, uh, you're looking at having one charger. Um, slow charging makes a lot of sense in, uh, in depots where you can park the car and charge it overnight. Um, again, be mindful of uh, that, that uh, limiter when it comes to AC charging. If you're getting a Nissan Leaf, um, anything more than uh, say 11 kilowatts, it, it's sort of just overkill. In fact, anything over 11 kilowatt AC probably is overkill. Um, in terms of price parity, and Lincoln touched on this before, um, some of the discussions I've been having, um, it seems as though when you incorporate the savings of servicing and, um, and of course, the reduction of cost of fuel and, of course, the FPT that, uh, that Wayne mentioned, um, price parity is probably a bit more achievable and closer than you think. So sort of, sort of looking at the ballpark of around three to four years. Um, and, of course, it'll be different in different jurisdictions, but... Um, but getting those EVs is a lot more attainable than what you might think. Um, where also a, a, a final plug for Jolt have certainly plugged the hell of, uh, out of us today, um, but uh, also looking at fleet subscription models. So in terms of combining what you're doing um, in the depot, but also combining it with um, when the vehicles are out in the wild, um, really making sure that you're covered across all those different eventualities um, is pretty interesting. But otherwise, look, that's it for me. Um, uh, I'll hand it over to the next speaker, but um, an absolute pleasure. Would love to connect um, after the meeting. Um, 
I think in the next slide, it might have my contact details, but I'm sure Shane can um, uh, share it with you if you're interested. But otherwise, thanks for your time and, um, and hope to hear from you all soon. Thank you, Andrew. Um, yeah, as I said earlier, this has been recorded and will be then um, downloaded into the, into the equipment and then there'll be links um, sent out to the current viewers and also a link on the local buy site. So you are able to see Andrews as well as all the other presenters' contact details. And if you can't find them, um, just contact me because I've got them, obviously. So next up, we've got um, Nathan Gore-Brown. Um, I think, Nathan, you're just doing it on your own. Yeah, today. look, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it uh, uh, myself today. Mark's actually uh, delivering at the ITS uh, Summit in Brisbane today. So that's uh, everybody I can ask you guys. Uh, got people there as well and so on. So it's, it's a pretty, pretty busy time. Um, not sure how uh, my slides are going to look. So, um, because uh, I did have an intro slide. Okay, and so we'll go on yeah. from there. So, um, I'll, um, uh, I'm here today as a, as a basically a, a decarbonisation for transport consultant movement. So, uh, uh, and I'll go to the next slide. Is a, um, uh, is focused on um, supporting the um, the whole industry from uh, federal government, state governments, right through to, to fleets in in that transition, every aspect of it. Um, Mark, some of you may have known Mark. He's, he's been in running the organisation for a while, and I joined him about four years ago. Um, and I've um, uh, and and I come from a, a, a I guess a quarter of a century of, of automotive um, uh, activity at different manufacturers. Um, and then also I've been an EV owner for for three years, um, living it. And I have the only uh, Honda E in Queensland, which is a, a nice claim to fame until someone else brings one in. And I'd love to see more. Um, if you flick on for me. Um, what we do as an organisation is, is we kind of find ourselves a bit of the glue in amongst what's going on around um, the whole space. We work with NGOs and research organisations, the government, and particularly with fleets. And we work a lot with fleets. We, we are the local buy supplier. Um, and this is the only sort of plugging that I'm going to do. I, I wanted to, you know, we, we, we do a lot of independent work. We, we don't sell anything. We don't provide We don't provide services. We don't provide money. We provide you frank and fearless advice uh, to fleets about um, about the whole the whole piece around the approach of, of EVs, and so if you just flick on for me, um, you'll see some of the some of the names that we've worked with, working with. Um, uh, there was a commonality there with um, with Andrew. Uh, we actually did in a way. Uh, sorry, the um, Northern Beaches Council uh, transition plan about three and a half years ago is when I first started, and uh, it's great to see Northern Beaches in Sydney uh, really kicking on with all that work that um, that Joel's doing. Um, so we've worked, we've worked with lots of councils particularly, but also state government fleets, including the Tasmanian government. So if we just flick on, I wanted to touch today on giving, we engage with lots of fleets and we, we see where they're coming from. We, we actually get the, instead of um, like what Lincoln said, um, getting approached by fleet managers, we often get approached by sustainability managers, but we end up back to the fleet manager anyway. Um, and what we hear from fleets is that they often facing um, questions around charging, I need a charging solution. We wanna go EVs, I want a charging solution. Um, I don't know what models are available. Can you give me a list? I've got the internet too. Um, but on top of that, um, we, all, we also want to go and fix the, um, the most polluting vehicles and often um, in, and emitting vehicles. So in a fleet for a council, it might be a sweeper or some of the trucks and so on. And, and, and they actually present some of the more challenging sectors. So what I thought, what we find ourselves doing is, is really flipping it on its head and saying, actually, what we need to do is start with these few things first and those other things, they'll come as, as a roll on. So if we just flick on here, I wanted to touch on three major topics that we find we need to go work through with fleets um, uh, in, in the early part of their transition. And then we finally get onto some of those elements that are in the green box. That strategic alignment, which Lincoln talked about before, and I'll just add a little bit of thought on that, uh, model availability, the number one barrier we have to transitioning to um, zero emission vehicles uh, in Australia at the moment, and a little bit about costs. And my cost concepts might be a little bit different to what we've heard today. So I might, um, I might excite you with just how affordable they are today. So if we flick on, I'm just gonna start with strategic alignment. So your strategy should drive all of your decisions. You know, everybody says, um, oh, I want to go EVs. First question that says, why? Is it about the technology? Is it about an emissions approach? And if you just flick on for me, Shane, um, there'll, be, there'll be some drivers in the organisation. More often than not, particularly in council environment or, or fleet environment, I've found that 
it's got nothing to do with any of those factors. It's because the mayor said so, or the GM said so. And so actually the driver for looking at change and then ultimately making change isn't always the same. And so I think it's really important that organizations truly understand what it is that's driving their desire to make a change from the status quo. Um, and then I'll just get you to flick on for me. Um, the, um, we really need to ask yourselves, what are the current goals of the organization um, and how, how do you want to set those goals in the future? Are they, are they due to change? So if you don't currently have a, you know, a zero emissions target or a zero emissions um, commitment, um, are you going to have one? Because that will obviously influence this. You know, take, for instance, if, if emissions was um, the true driver of everybody's needs, we'd all be in hybrids yesterday and we'd all be in EVs tomorrow. Um, but we know that's not the case in most fleets. So when we think about strategy, um, what we find is, is people say, well, I wanna, you know, I, we want to transition. And I guess to Lincoln's point before, that's not digital. It is a, an, over, an over a period of time. And it will take us collectively a couple of cycles, or lease cycles or so on, ownership cycles, to, to go through that process. And if we go on to the next, next page, um, what we find is many jurisdictions like to put their hand up and say, um, I want to be 100% by 2030. 100% zero emission or EV by 2030. And there's even, a, there's even a club for that. It's called EV100. You can go out and pledge and say, I want to be EV100. Um, for, for many do, and we, we advise them to. But there's two or three different ways to go about doing that. You could do it all tomorrow, or you could do it nothing until the last cycle. And so if you flick on for me, there's, a, there's the rate of change. And, and again, the rate of change is going to be um, really up to those drivers. Um, and if you flick on for me once more there, Shane, um, you'll see that if you were, if you had that goal, but were a late adopter, you could actually change all of your vehicles in that last cycle at 26, 27, that sort of time frame, and be 100% EV by 2030, but you will have made all the emissions that occurred over the period of time in advance. So that's probably just bringing to a, a head about um, what is it that you're really looking to achieve. And so um, one of the key factors that is going to um, get in the way of, of, of particularly the green line there, particularly that more advantageous line, um, is the ability to get hold of vehicles. And so I'm going to switch over to that now as we have a look at the um, next slide. And, um, and then again, I'm going to talk about availability. So we have um, EVs in many segments in Australia as of today. So 20, um, and, and, um, and Lincoln showed a, a little list of those as well. And we can see that lots and lots of brands are, are going to move on that as well. We saw that from the uh, S&P file that uh, Lincoln showed. Um, and in 2023, just, just in, that, in that future vision, we start to see some more cars in some more segments. And obviously that, that EV um, ute is the holy grail for Australia. Um, we'll get one in this market, but I don't expect we will see more than that for um, a good couple of years. Um, I don't think the big players that we all buy and know and love today are going to have an EV, full battery electric EV, um, version in their fleets anytime soon. Um, and we'll say that before 2025. And uh, this is my prediction. Um, and um, we might see some FEVs, some plug-in hybrids in advance of that, but I suspect that will be few and far between. So the ute space is gonna be still one of those bastions, particularly for, for operational fleets, fleets that are doing tradey work. Um, one of the first things we say is, have you considered a light truck? Or, and then you can EV that, or have you considered a van? because I know lots of fleets who have chosen to go to vans for other reasons, um, and an EV might be a reason to go there. Now, this landscape's gonna get better, the policy environment's gonna get better, and hopefully that will get, that will get good for, uh, get, get, uh, get to a good space for us. And for those who run light and medium-sized rigids, there's plenty of options out there, and you should really start to get, your, get into them, because in that medium to large size, that sort of nine ton plus, that can actually be more cost-effective to run as an EV today. Um, if you flick on for me one, um, one of the things that seems to come up a lot when I speak to fleets, particularly, you know, publicly, um, publicly run fleets, um, councils and so on, is that um, there's a bit of a there's a bit of a stigma about which brands they might buy. And and at this stage, I've seen lots of organizations say we're not going to buy a Tesla. I'm happy to buy a Hyundai that costs more than a Tesla, but I'm not going to buy a Tesla. OK, fine. The challenge is if you choose not to buy a Tesla in your or have it in your list, you will not get any cars anytime soon because Tesla is 75% of the market. It was last year, will be more this year. And this is going to continue to be the case because we still have an availability problem here in Australia. So when you're thinking about 
the sorts of things that are within scope of a, of a transition really do challenge those held beliefs of, of um, you know, uh, Tesla's a posh brand, say, for instance, um, even though the Hyundai is more expensive than the Model 3 um, or the Model Y for that fact. And so just be really, just be really mindful of that because those are the sorts of things that are going to get in the way of your, um, of your availability side. Much more to talk about that. I could go on for hours and I won't, but, um, but that's, that's really going to be something that you're going to have to, to think about more. And it really comes back to what Lincoln said, where you have to start planning now, because if you want to be either on one of those trajectories or you want to get a, a, a volume of vehicles within the fleet in, in a period of time, particularly over the next couple of years, you're going to have to start ordering them now to get them next year to then be able to be using them in the, in the years um, subsequent. Um, and in fact, with some, most fleets right now, I'm saying you'll get no more, there'll be no vehicles this financial year. Start planning for the first vehicles that you're going to get in the following financial year, just to be prudent, because that's probably what's going to happen. If we flick on, I just wanted to um, um, uh, have a little bit of a deep dive into what's going on here. Why is that the case? So lots of detail on this. I'm going to try and do it in about 45 seconds. Um, the world is mostly subject to fuel efficiency standards, which means that vehicles must be sent to those markets. And if they don't, they get fined. The brands get fined. And in Europe, it's massive, like it's billions and trillions. Um, and if they, don't, if they don't bring EVs to the, to the um, market, they're going to have to pay big fines for bringing all of the ICE vehicles, which is why we're getting none. It's called the black hole of Europe in my, in my book. And right now, many models and the volumes of models are going to Europe because they have to to avoid those fines and then we don't get any. And that's part of the reason why I, why I imported a Honda E because I love the car, I wanted one and I was never gonna get one from Honda Australia. Um, so I did it myself. It's not that hard, but it is, it is a, a flight of passion. So if we flick on here, some of the other things that are showing, are showing themselves to us in the next little while is that, we, and we'll flick on again, is that um, we currently have policies that are in Australia we're putting charging in place. We're putting incentives on the bonnet. We're going to start doing things like, you know, FBT, I'll talk about a tiny bit more in a second. On the basis of already having about a six to one to a 10 to one demand ratio. And that's shown through some of the Hyundai and Kia figures where they've said, we've got 3000 people for these 500 cars. Well, there's six to one demand ratio. Um, and if we flick on, we're going to see that with the FBT um, legislation that is making its way through the federal parliament, my prediction is that that number, that number times this by five. So we're going to have somewhere in the order of 30 to 50 times, uh, 30, 30 to 50 times of people behind one vehicle available. Now, their numbers, you can halve them, you can double them, it doesn't really matter. It's lots more than is available. And so that's going to hold prices up, keep demand, um, keep uh, waiting queues long, and we're all going to be fighting like seagulls over the same ships. And so get in early if you are interested in going in this direction. Get planning early and, and even get buying early. If we flick on further, um, I, it'll just mentions those things that I just talked about and go once more. So it's time to get moving. But if we get moving, what's it gonna cost us? So let's flick over to the next and final topic that I'll talk about, which is on, um, which is on costs. Uh, and so, I don't just think about costs today. You can go to, to Lincoln and Wayne and you can get a, um, you can get a, a whole of life uh, valuation right now. You can do your own total cost of ownership tool. There's plenty online. I'm happy to talk to you about them. Um, that's great for today, but what's it gonna be like over time? So um, we've got fuel costs. What's the fuel cost gonna be tomorrow, next week in 2030? Um, we couldn't have probably predicted that we were gonna get $2.20 now. Um, residual values is always the biggest part of a total cost of ownership um, uh, calculation, and um, there are schools of camp, there are schools of schools of thought out there, some camps out there where EVs will have very high residual value, EVs will have very low residual value, um, and and everything in between. And then also there's the ICE vehicle um, residual values that you know everybody's going to want heads forever, um, everybody's going to want utes forever, or no one's going to want to buy an ICE vehicle ever again, and they're all going to tank. And so there's a lot of opinion around that, and that's all it'll ever be until it actually plays out. But right now, you've got to, you've got to build that into your process. And, and where's EV pricing going? I'm personally here to say EV pricing is not coming down anytime soon. There will be no sticker price parity anytime soon, probably 28, 29, something like that. Batteries, you can halve the price of the battery, and it still only takes five grand out of the car. 
So it's really not gonna make a big difference. They've got to pay back all that R&D over a long time. But if we flick on one, what we've got to ask ourselves is what it's gonna be like in 2030? Because as you transition your fleet, you're transitioning cycles and cycles of vehicles. Um, you've got to think about when is the crossover point for um, total cost of ownership? When is, what is the premium today? What is the premium? When does it cross over to, to zero? Is it already there? Or, and what's it going to be? What's the negative position? When is EVs going to be far cheaper than petrol vehicles in the future? And so if we flick once more, um, you just need to get yourself ready. And as a fleet, get fit, get ready, get your data sorted out. So many times we engage with um, fleets that their data is just not very great. Um, whether that be fuel car data, fleet data, don't even know where the vehicle's housed. Really get to, get down, sorted out. Um, understand the use of those vehicles, and then um, consider your your data as as to what you've seen as the transition of those vehicles. And if we flick once more, um, just want to talk about probably the most controversial uh, topic I'll talk about today um, is that um, once more for me, Shane, um, we believe that in certain segments and in certain comparisons, total cost of ownership is cheaper for an EV today than it is for a typical ICE vehicle. This is a medium sized vehicle. So we're talking Camry or what was, um, uh, you know, like, um, I guess, Octavia and um, yeah, all those sorts of vehicles. Um, that, that medium sized car, the typical, the typical sedan that uh, might be in a fleet. Um, and we've got many of those councils we talked about and many more, we've got, um, typical fleet average data from real councils around Australia. And we've, and that's what the, the data is on the side there, an annual total cost of ownership with the com com, um, combination of depreciation and operating. And when we do that versus um, using the same kinds of depreciation percentages, the same type of schedules for the two Model 3 examples here versus, um, and, and the, the total cost of ownership um, when you boil it all up, four years, 80,000 Ks, which is a typical kind of um, lease we might see it in a council or in a main fleet. Forget about FBT for a second, because that's gonna make it even cheaper. It's cheaper today. And that might not be what you get getting, you see from a lease um, a provider. We see this all the time. There's lots of other factors that they might be building into that process. But if you're a council that buys vehicles, funds them yourself, funds the um, repairs, even does the repairs yourself, it's going to be cheaper. And if we flick on to, to the next slide, uh, the, the next piece of animation, um, the things you can do to make them that way is hold them a little longer than you do. The more fuel you burn, the more you're going to save over time. So the more kilometers you do, the more you save over time. Um, and charge slowly, um, overnight if you can, on a charger in your, in your depot if you can. Um, and that would generally be cheaper. To Andrew's point before, I always tell councils at this point in time, one-to-one -one charger, charger relationship in your fleet right now. Maybe one day we'll get one to two, the two to one, or maybe maybe more in the future. But when talking about an AC charger in your fleet being used for your, um, used for your fleet, then that would be it, one-to-one uh, -one ratio. And just flick onto the final slide. I just thought I'd recap on all those thoughts because I've rushed through a little bit. Um, there's a lot to think about, start early understand what your goals are, really work out what is council trying to achieve. Is it emissions? Is it costs? Is it just because we want to be part of the cool, cool club? Um, and, then, and then finally, as we sort of go on to there, um, costs are variable. Um, you really need to dig into them, but they can be more affordable now. And you're really going to have to um, get ready to wait for vehicles to come to the market for you to be able to purchase them because it's going to be a challenge. So thank you very much. Um, I'll hand back to Shane. Happy to take questions with the team later on and, um, and looking forward to um, uh, hearing more about all of the, your transition uh, plans in the future. Excellent. Thank you, Nathan, for that. Um, yeah, very interesting, that little point that you made just in the last slide about um, overnight charging. Um, as a number of you might know, I've got an EV, have done for five years. And um, just plug into the good old 240 volt with a, um, at night. And yes, it takes all night, but you know what? I don't have to sit there and watch it. It does it while I sleep or not sleep. Um, and actually you get a better, you get a longer range out of the battery than if you're going to, you know, even AC charges in your shopping centers or car parking setups. So, and of course we know that, you know, DC charges are great, but they're not, 
not ideal for every time you charge. So. Anyway, so next up, uh, there's Nathan's contact details and um, you'll all get a copy of this after this. Um, next up, we've got Stephen Tobin. Now, Stephen, I'm hoping that you actually have signed in. Yeah, I'm in. Had a, had a bit of a challenge, but uh, managed to get there. No worries. So I guess I've got a, a slightly different take on uh, electric vehicles, and I mean this is obviously um, with uh, with tyres for electric vehicles. Um, so we'll roll on. Next slide. So, and again. Yep. So. What are the tyre trends or what do we see um, or what are, what are we always looking for? I guess we're always looking for increased performance. Um, we see a trend towards larger rim sizes. Um, we see more sizes as a, a massive proliferation of sizes over the years. Um, we see vehicles moving to um, global platforms, so often the same platform used for uh, a few different vehicles. Um, we see a lot of development efficiency, you know, in our factories um, and, and around the world, everyone's obviously looking for efficiency. Um, and we see growing regulations, um, you know, in the tyre industry as well. Next slide. I guess the future of mobility for us, um, you know, we've sort of put it into an acronym, acronym of, of FACE, um, as in fleets, uh, by 2030, 25% of global miles will be um, shared um, in shared vehicles. Autonomy by 2035, um, 21 million self-driving cars will be on the road in the US. Um, the connection cars are the third fastest growing device after phones and tablets. And the electric piece is uh, first million electric vehicles sold in six years about the second million sold in two years. So obviously there's a massive acceleration into the electric, uh, into the electric vehicles. So there's a transformation in, in uh, mobility ecosystem. Next slide. So what are the, what are the challenges of migrating from ICE vehicles to EVs um, and the influences on uh, performance requirements for tyres. So we see an increased vehicle weight and a lower centre of gravity. Uh, we have increased wheel torque, um, range anxiety, which um, the previous speakers have, have talked about, um, which is improving as, as time goes along. Um, very quiet, uh, they're very quiet engines, obviously. Um, so, and we have more um, electronic control systems in the vehicles. Next slide. And what are the influences on tyres or the impacts on tyres? So EV, we have an increased vehicle weight. So we have a higher load uh, capacity tyres that are, there's another category of tyres now in HL tyres, so high load capacity tyres. We have increased wheel torque. So the tyres, um, we need to, you know, um, have better wear and resistance and, and uh, improved grip. Um, for, from range anxiety, what do we do? We optimise energy losses and reduce rolling resistance in tyres. Um, for a quiet powertrain, um, obviously the noise of tyres comes to the fore as you take away engine noise, you'll, you'll now hear um, other noises that were previously uh, covered up by engine noise. So internal and external tyre noise. Um, we'd see advanced electronic control systems so intelligent tyres and connected tyre vehicle systems are, are, you know, are, are where, they're, where they're heading with tyres. Next slide, please. And so these are some of the things. What do we do to, to overcome that? As vehicle weight is higher, um, we, we increase, you know, um, reinforce the overlay and the belt package. We reinforce the, the casing ply, the gauge, the, the stiffness and the coating. We reinforce the, um, the bead apex and, and the construction of the lower sidewall. You know, heavier bead bundles, um, more low um, hysteresis or low rebound rubber uh, to reduce the rolling resistance uh, in the tyre. 
roll on to the next one. From a wear resistance and grip, um, EV tire wear is generally faster. So, so there's a higher torque, faster acceleration potential. So driver's uh, influence is significant. Um, there's an increased vehicle weight, so the tires need to accelerate and stop this mass. Uh, so more responsive traction control uh, has some tread wear benefits. Um, so we do a lot of finite element analysis, um, tread pattern design for better wear evenness and reduce pattern noise under high torque and high load. Um, we tune or, or play with tread compound innovations to, to um, provide traction, tread life and lower the rolling resistance of the tire. Next. Uh, energy loss optimization. So rolling resistance. So what are the things that we do? Low rolling resistant tire, you know, as we, we spoke about um, FEA optimize the casing. So tread, tread design, the tread compound, um, the belt construction, the ply coating, the sidewall compound, the chafer, all of these things have uh, an impact. So we tune them up to, you know, to lower our rolling resistance. We improve um, tyre aerodynamic contribution. So even things like where you used to have raised lettering on the sidewall, a lot of that is um, embedded into the tyre now to, you know, as a, as a silhouette in the sidewall, you know, the tyre width has looked at, the, the, the sidewall smoothness to, um, to, you know, better handle um, airflow um, and lower that, uh, that uh, energy loss. Next. Tire noise um, is obviously becoming more prevalent. So again, what are, the, what are the controls that we put in place? So with EVs making less noise, the tire noise becomes more important. So internal and external noise. So if you look at the, the graph down the bottom, you see you get a peak in tire cavity uh, resonance. Because of the tire, I mean, if it's, it's, it's like a, a drum, I guess, if you hit something on the road, it reverberates around the tire and, and it, and it just bounces off the smooth surfaces on the inside of the tire. So we've now used materials on the inside of the tire to absorb that, um, that sound. You know? And so if you look at the, the red line versus the blue line, you see it smooths out the edges and just, um, I guess, sucks up a bit of that noise and brings that noise level of the tire down. So in Goodyear, we just um, we call it sound comfort technology applies a sound absorbing foam into the inside surface of the tire and reduces the tire cavity resonance noise peak. Next. Uh, Goodyear is already approved on multiple current EV platforms, Tesla, Ford, Audi and uh, Mercedes. So the efficient grip performance and electric drive GT with electric drive technology a good year's later step in developing tyres that meet the specific demands of electric vehicles. And we've put logos on the sidewall, that electric drive logo. I mean, it's just, you know, it's moving towards, you know, the tyres of the future for electric vehicles. Next slide. Um, so the transformation to mobility or the future mobility, um, the FAC piece of it, um, I'll go to roll on to the next uh, slide, please. So Goodyear's um, cur or current tyres, classical tyres, transfer forces and connect the, the vehicle to the road. Beyond tyres, I guess the smart tyres that will transmit data, um, they're connected to the vehicle. Um, integrated tyres create insights, um, adaptive tyres initiate responses. So there's things that I guess that they'll put into tires, you know, tires that'll tell you when they when they need pumping up, tires that will uh, be able to communicate this and connect with drivers to allow them. So tire pressure monitoring systems, tire wear, um, as as we talked about before, that you know maybe 25% of vehicles will be, you know, rideshare style vehicles. They can connect back to fleet managers to let them know um, that this vehicle is, is either A, it's got low tire pressure or B, it, you know, they can book um, services around that. So there's 
a lot of smart technology that's coming in in relation to uh, to tyres to allow fleets to be able to preempt and book vehicles in, knowing that their tyres are coming up for replacement. Um, next slide, please. So currently we have standard tyres. Punches will result in inflation pressure loss. Low inflation pressures often lead to tyre failures. Um, and then they've moved on to run on flat. So they can operate at low or zero pressure for short distances at reduced speed. Um, there's also sealant tyres. Um, so, so they self-seal um, tread area punches um, and non-pneumatic tyres now. So airless tyres, you know, are future concepts that are, you know, that they're looking for, in, you know, on, especially on automated vehicles. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, tyre pressure monitoring. So dash warning alerts the driver to tyre inflation pressure concerns. Um, and there's different sorts of sensors that they use. Direct sensors um, are located in or on the valve or in, inside the um, the tyre or, or attached to the wheel um, and measure actual pressure. Uh, indirect, so wheel speed sensors from the ABS system detect changes in revolutions um, to alert of a deflated tire. Um, so mandated in 2007 and 2014 in Europe, they're becoming common um, on models sold in Australia and market as well. So it, it proliferates around the world. So next slide, please. So there's rim mounted sensors. So we have more of these, um, especially in truck fleets um, and in car fleets as well. Um, there's fleet operation dictates the best solution. So the frequency of vehicle returning to base, um, live monitoring versus gateway monitoring. So sometimes it can be driving in and out of a gateway um, and it'll measure you know, your pressure when you're coming in and out. Um, rigid trucks versus prime movers and trailers, uh, fleet maintenance reporting requirements and low pressure warning. So the first one um, is the rim mounted sensor. There's valve mounted sensors um, that you can, you can use, as I said, as a drive in through a gateway system, or there's now um, the third option there is a drive over reader. So you can run a, a semi trailer over this with 32 wheels, for instance, it'll measure the tread depth. It'll measure the, the, the tire pressure in all the tires. Um, you know, I mean, you slow down your speed to uh, around about 10 kilometers an hour, but Roughly, it'd measure, you know, 32 tyres on a, on a B-double um, combination in about 30 to 40 seconds um, and give you a, a, a printout of tyre pressures and um, and tyre tread depth. So I guess it gives it um, more concentrated on rather than have to go around and check pressures on 32 wheels, um, even if it was, you know, two or three minutes per tyre, um, it's, you know, when you're talking about 30 tyres, it's a, you know, a job that takes more than an hour rather than a targeted approach that maybe only two or three tyres need to be um, topped up with air. Next. Uh, so the future or intelligent tyres, where do we see it going? Um, data acquisition um, and tyres are one of the few components um, not communicating with the vehicle. So sensors, um, you know, and plus the vehicle um, and, you know, plus, plus a cloud will allow this data to be fed back into fleet management um, via algorithms. Next slide. So if we looked at a tire pressure um, temperature monitoring, um, tire identification, especially, I guess, important in truck fleets where tires move around a lot more. Um, tire load state, um, tire wear state, and tire road friction indicator. So, short term, the product development on tire mounted uh, tire pressure monitoring systems with a tire ID um, and an algorithm developed. So, a tire force model adaption. Uh, algorithm that leverage uh, tyre mounted sensors and longer term the tyre is the first component uh, to detect brake lockup or wheel slip 
Yet today we still re rely on downstream ABS or yaw or steering angle sensors. Using tyre mounted sensors, the tyre provides live friction wear uh, and pressure data would be available to the vehicle or to the fleet manager, for instance. Next slide, please. So I guess from Goodyear's perspective, um, we've also got some, some bold goals. Um, so by 2023, we'll be more than, uh, more than double the flow of technology releases leading to more winning products and solutions. By 2024, we'll reduce uh, complexity across our consumer portfolio by using 30% fewer components and releasing 90 plus uh, on common platform. Um, by 2024, we'll be the preferred OE supplier achieving first approval for development um, SKUs with only one physical iteration. Um, by 2025, we'll consistently deliver highest value, lowest cost of ownership to commercial OTR and aviation fleets. And by 2027, um, we'll reinvent tyres and service delivering data and sensors enabled intelligent um, in all new products. And by 2030, We'll win with responsible innovation by introducing the first 100% sustainable material and maintenance free tire. Um, so, I mean, they've got some bold goals of, of where, they, where they'd like to be in the future. I guess it's a, a bit of a plug for Goodyear. Um, and next slide, please. Um, I guess that's the end of my presentation and um, I'll hand back to Shane and, um, and we can cover any questions that there might be. Excellent. Thank you, Stephen, for that. And um, yeah, we will jump into Q&A, and I can see there's a few questions up there, um, which would... Um, yes, looks like a couple of cheeky ones, and, um, and somebody couldn't hear um, somebody at one o'clock. So one o'clock must have been about... Um, Nathan Gore, Brown, so. Oh, no, I think it was actually before me. Um, it might have been during, it was a little earlier than that. Don't get so defensive, Nathan. Okay. <laughs> I remember reading it before my call. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah. Look, yeah it, um, could have been, it could have been me right at the very end. Apologies <laughs> to, to the person, um, uh, Maria, who couldn't hear me. Look, um, it's all been recorded, so um, if there's anything, people will be able to get the opportunity to um, have a listen to this at, the, uh, at their leisure again. So um, if we've got any other questions, um, either pop your hand up or um, put it in the Q&A. I've got a question that we can kick off, if you like, with, uh, with Stephen. Um, just, uh, you know, EV tyres on the market today from Goodyear. Uh, uh, is there... Is there some that are specifically out there? I recently threw some tyres at my uh, one of my cars, and and I did, wasn't wasn't easily easily seen for me. Yeah, look, there there's a few that are out there. Um, I guess specifically the ones that are the um, original fitments uh, on EV vehicles, um, but they are. I guess starting to slowly turn into um, ranges of of tyres that will be. EV, um, you know, compatible. I, I guess there's not lots of them out there at the moment, but there's there's definitely some. Cool. I just and just on that, I'll just um, Nathan. Obviously, you've been through the exercise of getting new tyres. I did about uh, twelve months ago, I think. Now, um, this is a matter of interest you know my car I still managed to get about 96,000 k's um, on the original tires um, yes they uh, a little bit in short supply because they're coming out of Europe uh, a little bit pricier than your um, your average um, tire that you might get from um, a cheap tire mart um, yeah but um, I did find them you know I still got the good wear and tear. To be honest, I've stopped tearing around the streets like a, a raven lunatic that I might have done when I was 20 something. Uh, and for those people who are new to EVs, probably your first three months you'll do, um, 
you'll try and drag everybody off at the lights, um, all that sort of thing. That's pretty normal. But I, I still managed to get, you know, what I'd call my pretty, pretty much average sort of lifespan out of tyres for myself. So I feel disappointed if I get less than um, less than 90,000 out of a set of tyres. I, I, you would be disappointed because I got about 50, but I still thought that was pretty reasonable. The you know, say 90, cool 90 is a bit towards the top end, yeah. Yeah, I, I've just got old man syndrome. I can't get, I don't care anymore about being the first off the mark. So. Uh, I was going to just pick up on, uh, I think the challenge that Andrew threw out just about the uh, charging station density to, to vehicles. Uh, Nathan's got a position on that. Um, and, you know, if you talk to Somebody like Jet Charge, they will also say one to one because you know they, they want to sell more charging stations. But I think what what I wanted to point out was it really comes down to what the charging strategy is for the fleet. Um, and you could, in some cases, absolutely, it's going to be a one to one, and that's going to be in cases where the vehicles come to base and they're there all day and they need to be charged up, and you've got multiple fleets, and you don't want a concierge service. You know, you don't want that station being. Um, being consumed while the car is full, you want to take it away so the next car come in. But it really comes down to the driving patterns. You know how 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 many kilometers are they doing per day? Are they coming to base? Uh, research shows that eighty percent of all charging is done at, at home. Uh, so do they have access to home charging or the or the twenty four volt um, you know ten amp ch trickle charger? Is there a, a DC fast charging nearby? You know. I think you need to look at it holistically. And unfortunately, I don't think there's one answer that fits all fleets. Um, and that's something that when I go in and talk to a customer is like, what? let's have a look at your driving patterns. Let's look at your telematics data if you've got it to see where they're, where they're traveling, overlay that with a public charging network. You know, all that type of thing comes into play. Um, it's no one size fits all is my view. And, and, and just to riff on that, and um, I don't want to confuse the audience by throwing out different ratios. Uh, because I tend to agree with Nathan's approach, but but just to just to I guess break down those mental barriers of oh God, you know we need to have millions of these charges. Mm. Um, there are councils who are getting away with four to one, but again, just feeding into what uh, Lincoln mentioned, it it is purely a function of um, of uh, you know use different use cases, how you use your fleet, are they out in the wild for long periods of time? those kind of things. But they are looking at going towards that two to one. Mm -hmm. um, but as as mentioned, I think Nathan's um, Nathan and Lincoln have hit it on the head. I think more of a one to one is is the way to go. At least in the beginning, yeah. Yeah, and, and to tie that all together is, is really making sure that the charging stations are smart and that you can get the data and in particular the utilization data. So you can, you can start with your one-to-one. -one. Um, in our example, in Pimble, for instance, uh, we've got four charging stations um, and we know that we can put on quite a, a number of extra EVs without having to put additional charging stations in because the utilization rate of those charging stations is so low. Um, so being able to access the data and make some data-driven insights, you know, it's a bit of a cliche term, but it's really quite important with the charging stations. Absolutely. And I think one thing you can add to that, if you've particularly got a fleet, like look, take uh, your example there, if you can have a booking system and, and you can book in um, generally, but real generalisation, but probably most of those vehicles are certainly charged within a half day, let's say, if they're going to the office. So four in the hours in the morning, four in the hours in the afternoon, most vehicles will be charged in, in, in that kind of four hour gap. Um, they, uh, you know, you could utilize it twice in the day, say, for instance, and then maybe even if there was a full vehicle that could be that could charge at the night time. So there's almost three utilizations in a day. So, but that what I find is that, um, you know, staff behavior, um, getting people to behave like that, uh, you know, if anybody's been in an organization with a pool vehicle, you know, it gets abused and left on left on the light, you know, the fuel light all the time anyway. So there's going to be some challenges around that. And one of the things I think, you know, all, all of us in this space recognize is that education and behavior mm. change is going to be in you know, a change management is going to be one of the biggest challenges for fleets taking their users, their staff, their, their, their stakeholders through that journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I guess, um, again, just to expand upon Lincoln and, and your point as well, Nathan, I mean, uh, the slow charging will address a lot of the use cases. Fast charging does open up to a lot more use cases. Um, so just being mindful um, that, uh, you know, it is, 
a bit of an ecosystem. Um, there are different solutions for different news purposes. So, mm. I mean, perhaps in the larger depots, maybe one pass charger just opens up a lot more use cases. For example, if you've got visitors just coming for half an hour, or if you just need to get a, just a whole lot of charge into one of those vehicles to get it back out on the road. Um, if you do have sort of satellite depots um, in just outside of the main depots that are on the fringes of an LGA, um, it, it would be interesting to also look at, you know, faster charges as well with those uh, situations. So, yeah, really, really fascinating, um, highly evolving space. I think, I think one of the things I'm noticing with different types of councils is, is kind of that where they're, where they're based and where their cohort are based. So particularly staff, if you're talking about leaseback vehicles or vehicles that are provided, if you're in a space where people are invariably in suburban homes with off street parking, then, you know, there's no need to worry too much about, you know, give them a charge or support that, work out the way that you're going to charge back. There are ways to do that. And, you know, Lincoln's got ideas. I'm sure I've got ideas and lots of others have got ideas about to do that, but if you're in a, if we're living, you know, predominantly you're going to be Queensland folks here. So if you're in a in a city area or a, or a terraced house area where it's on street parking and all that sort of stuff, and I'm seeing this in Sydney and Melbourne at the moment, um, that's where it really becomes challenging. And and actually, a, a solution like Andrew's is is like potentially the paramount solution. If you can put in, you know, uh, on a 25 kilowatt charger, that's about let's call it um, half a half a filling um, uh, for an hour. Um, that's going to be, you know, a 50 kilowatt hour, uh, 50 kilowatt batteries can give you a couple of hundred Ks, right? So 25 kilowatts, a couple of hundred Ks. In that sort of, uh, in that sort of um, approach, you, you then are talking about, like, say, half a week. So for an hour, as you go shopping at Woolies and you stop off, you can get an hour's worth of charge, which is half a week's worth of fuel. You don't need a home charger. And I think that's where we start to really see those use cases. And it's going to take, again, a lot of people getting their heads around it. But when we do, we can really be efficient with our charging approaches. Yeah, you're right. The average, the average commute, you know, law of averages is always fraught with danger, but it's about 30 kilometers per day. And if you've got a range of four, 500 kilometers, you only need to charge up once every 10 to 12 days. Yeah. So you're right. Those type of fast pickup when you go to Ikea or McDonald's or wherever it might yeah. be, it's going to be suitable. That's right. yep. Excellent. Well, look, thank you, gentlemen. Um, Robert Rickson asked a question. Um, online which oh, i jumped in and answered it unfortunately sorry i jumped in there I yeah, that's that's all cool um anybody that's had a little bit of experience in um, ev and charging are probably familiar with the, the plug share um, app that's um out there um, it's reasonably accurate it doesn't necessarily tell you whether they're um, occupied or whether they're they're broken down or not but it is a good good thing to be using when you're planning trips um, those of us in Queensland would be familiar with the state government's um, electric superhighway from Coolangatta through to mm. Cairns, and um, now it's extending west, you know, out out as far as Mount Isa and, and through, you know, Longreach and out out to Woomba and west. So um, they're they're kind of going to be the um, the arteries, and then I think from there. There'll be clusters around in, in smaller towns and the towns along the way that um, councils will put in place, as well as the commercial operators. So um, it'll be a different discussion in five years' time if we're talking about this. So, But I'd just like to thank everybody for presenting. Um, appreciate your time and appreciate the time the, um, the participants have um, set aside today. Um, been holding these every couple of months. And um, for my council people, the next webinar is going to be on the 12th of October. So two months time and we're back to good old supply and logistics in fleet and plant, which as we know, is um, giving everybody massive headaches at the moment. Um, so we'll be having some updates from uh, major industry players on that one. And um, I'll also be reaching out to um, council people in the meantime, to discuss um, future arrangements covering bulk fuel, um, fuel charge cards, oils, lubricants, and and that that area there. So, um, with that, I'd just like to thank everybody once again uh, for participating. Um, I will be um, saving this and uploading the links off to everybody. Um, you should start to see those uh, probably tomorrow, knowing the speed of my computer. So 
Thank you very much. Appreciate all your uh, attendance. That's great. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Shane. Thank you, Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thanks,